Hello, my name is Joseph Burton, and today I will be recording this sermon for Screaming Rock Ministries for the scholarship program. But yes, let's get right into the word to discuss the important topic of justification by faith. But before we start, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to open your word and to examine important truths which will help us to be able to live according to your will and to be as a light to others and to direct others to you and to your love, your free gift of grace which you have offered to all. That is my prayer now and be with me as I begin to open your word and to share a message from your word. Use me as an instrument in your hand, I ask in Christ's name. Amen. So the story goes of a man named Daniel Axtell. He was an English Puritan. And on October 19th, 1660, he was sentenced to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. Now, this was one of the most cruel deaths that one could face back in that time, or any time for that matter. And so what they would do, they would uh, hang you in, to the point where you were almost dead, but then they would start to cut you in pieces to disembowel you while you were still alive. And so that was the penalty, uh, the death penalty for those who were sentenced or who were condemned for treason against the English monarchy. So Daniel Axtell, he was a Puritan. He had fought against the Stuart monarchy during the English Civil War. So this was a conflict in which Parliament, the Parliamentarian forces, the Reformation forces there in England, they battled against King Charles I, who was a religious tyrant. He tried to force the Anglican worship on his subjects. And of course, the Parliamentarians, they won the war, and the uh, monarchy was overthrown, and a republic was established from 1649 until 1660, of course, under the leadership of the strong, um, great Puritan general Oliver Cromwell. But ultimately, in 1660, the monarchy was restored, and Charles II became King of England. And so the Puritans who had fought against the crown were arraigned before the courts and sentenced, many of them, to cruel deaths, as Daniel Axtell was. But what is interesting about this story is that when Axtell, when he was led to his death, his executioners, they noticed that he was defiant. He was not, well, not defiant, but he was unwavering. And so they asked him, why do you have so much courage when you are about to face this death? And Axtell replied, if I had 1,000 lives, lives, if I had a thousand lives, I would lay each one of them down for that good old cause. If I had a thousand lives, I would lay each one of them down for that good old cause. You see, the cause of freedom of religion, of liberty, of reforming the church was something that Axtell, he was willing to be hanged, drawn, and quartered a, a thousand times because of this cause. And so with that in mind, we see a similar thing in the Bible. And my attention is drawn to Romans chapter 5. And there in Romans chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, we see an interesting message. Verse 7, it states the following. It says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, per adventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. And so there you have kind of this story of Axtell. For a righteous man, for a righteous cause, we might be even willing to lay down our lives. But scarcely for that, even for a good man, for a good cause, are we willing to do that. But then verse 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so here we have the sum and substance, really, of righteousness by faith, that when we were completely 
estranged from God. We had no value. There was no value really in the human race. It was not a, a good, righteous cause really that Christ was dying for, but he came and he died for us. And therefore we have in Romans chapter 5 verse 1, it says, therefore, being justified, right? Let's, let's actually read that here. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are justified by this faith of God as a free gift. And of course, verse 15 of the same chapter talks about that gift by grace. And so this is very much a Pauline concept. We have the idea of righteousness by faith. And ultimately... We, we like to go to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, where it says, right, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, right, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so we have, throughout the book of Romans, we have this theme of faith that just resounds throughout the book. But of course... There's a context behind um, Romans chapter 1, verse 17, right? That uh, quote there, the just shall live by faith. And uh, we know that Paul, of course, was a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. And he's not just saying things out of the blue, but he is um, very well trained in rabbinical uh, techniques and he has a thorough knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures. And so he is actually quoting the book of Habakkuk. And he is quoting Habakkuk chapter 2, really verses 4 and 5 is the context there. So let's, let's go to the book of Habakkuk because though Paul makes these asseverations of these declarations about righteousness by faith, right? And of course, we know that that verse there in Romans 117 has been such an inspiration for so many people. Luther, of course, um, he's in the cloister there as a monk, right? And of course, he's reading the Bible in Latin, right? And he stumbles upon that verse, the just shall live by faith, right? Um, and that was very important to him and many others. But let us look at the Old Testament context to kind of establish the background, the contours of this verse. And so if you will turn with me in your Bibles to Habakkuk, and I will begin with verse 1. Of course, what is the background of Habakkuk? This is a very kind of unused book. Of course, we know about the uh, Babylonian captivity. Of course, Israel first divided into two nations, right? Israel goes into captivity, the northern kingdom, 722 BC. Because of apostasy, Assyria conquers. Then we have the southern kingdom falls gr more gradually beginning in 605, right? That's the first time Nebuchadnezzar attacks Jerusalem. He carries part of the treasures away, and of course he takes captive uh, Daniel and his friends and so on. And then, of course, we have again in 597, and then ultimately in 586. But before the downfall, the ultimate downfall of the nation, we had this decay of moral principles, of moral worth. The society kind of began to degrade from within. There was injustice, there was oppression, there was moral decadence, and so on. And so Habakkuk is a prophet of God at this time. So Israel, or Judah, is still a nation, but we have this, this horrible condition of things. And so he says in chapter 1, verse 2, he says, O Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou wilt not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? Right. So we have um, Habakkuk chapter one. You have these this dialogue between um, God and Habakkuk, and so the first four verses are Habakkuk talking to God about, okay, the injustice, the, de um, the moral decadence that is now in Judah, it's eating out the heart of the nation, and Habakkuk is like, why is this happening? You are a just God, right? You are a holy God, but your people are rotten, and so on. 
And then we have God's answer, right, in um, verses 5 through 11. And God's answer is, Behold, right? Verse 5, Behold among the heathen, and so on. But verse 6, For I raise up the Chaldeans, right, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. So you have this idea that Habakkuk, he's calling out to God and saying, hey, why is this state of injustice prevailing? And God's answer is, okay, I'll send the Chaldeans, I'll send the Babylonians to make things right, and they're going to come and, of course, um, cause destruction and loot and slaughter and so on and march through the land. So basically God is saying that, okay, I'm still the one on the throne. I am sovereign of over world events. I still control the geopolitical scene, right? Though crazy things might be happening. But is this the answer that Habakkuk wants to hear? Just think for a moment. We live in a crazy political situation right now. If we look at the geopolitical scene worldwide, we have, of course, wars in various places. There's divisions everywhere. And this is basically Okay, we have, even in America, that a society is very much um, degraded, but is God's answer, will we like the answer that, okay, God is sending someone else to take us captive who is less righteous, right? It's like, okay, it, it would be God saying, oh, I will send um, Russia, right, to solve your problems, or Hamas, right, to solve your problems, but we would think, hey, why, the, the, we're doing better than they are, right? So Habakkuk is like, why are you sending the Babylonians? And that doesn't make sense to me. And so we have his second prayer, um, sec Habakkuk's second complaint to God, um, beginning with verse 12. And he says, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine holy one? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment, and, O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. And he says, you are of pure eyes unto behold evil, and you cannot look on iniquity. Wherefore do you look upon them that deal treacherously, right? So the Chaldeans who deal treacherously, and so on. And he says, okay, wherefore are you basically, why are you bringing them? Verse 17, shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations, right? So they won't cease to slay the nations, they scourge the Babylonians. And so, again, Habakkuk, he is unsatisfied with God's answer. And so, how does God address Habakkuk the second time? Right? So the first time, Habakkuk is like, okay, the nation is in this state of degradation. And then God says, I'll send the Babylonians. And then Habakkuk is like, no, 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 please don't do that. That's not good. Um... He does not. He's frustrated with God's plans. right? And so this is very much, of course, Habakkuk is a book of theodicy. And so the idea of theodicy is that, okay, God is sovereign, right? We saw in um, verses 12 and 13, right? God is both sovereign and good, right? O Lord, my God, my Holy One, right? The Holy One of Israel, as Isaiah would put it. Um, verse 13, he is of purer eyes than to behold evil. So this is God of purer eyes than to behold evil, and he cannot look on iniquity, and yet he's allowing these things to happen, this injustice. We have sin, the problem of sin and wickedness. And Habakkuk is wrestling with this idea of theodicy. And so what is God's answer? And there we get into chapter 2. I will stand upon my watch, says the prophet, and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he, what God, will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Then we have verse 2. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold his soul, 
which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And so we have here in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Of course, this is where um, Paul quotes in Romans 1.17, the just shall live by his faith. So ultimately, God's answer to Habakkuk is whatever is going on, the problem of sin, the problem of wickedness, the problem of injustice that is going on in the world, you are to live by faith. You are to accept the gift of my righteousness, and you are to lead a life of faith. And how do we get, of course, to God's gift here? Now, it's very interesting. It says, of course, the just shall live by his faith. And people debate, what does it mean by his faith? And... This can be taken both ways. It can be made, okay, the just shall live by his faith, the Messiah's faith, or by his own faith. Because in verse 3, it says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now, in the Hebrew, it can be um, translated, though he tarry. Wait for him, because he will surely come. He will not tarry. And this, of course, the Hebrew could be either it or him, but I, we can favor the, the reading he, because in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 37 and 38, which we believe was written by the Apostle Paul according to Ellen White, um, it says in Hebrews 10 there, for yet a little while, now he's again, Paul is quoting Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. So instead of the it, like we saw before, he chooses to interpret the Hebrew as he, that is the Messiah. He will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any, any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So here Paul, um, he takes the passage there from Habakkuk and he gives it its messianic meaning there, its messianic import, that we are to have faith in the coming of the Messiah. And it's interesting, if we go back, of course, to Habakkuk chapter 2, in the Septuagint, so the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it says, the just shall live by my faith. So his faith, my faith, okay, now it's referring to Yahweh or the, the Messiah who's coming. He will come, he will not tarry, the just shall live by his faith, but it's also the Lord who is speaking, and so it says my faith. And so that's very interesting. Now we have, okay, the idea of theodicy, that this is God's answer, is that he is in control and the Messiah is coming, and so we can have faith and live by the Messiah's faith, his faithfulness. Of course, the word in he both in Hebrew and in Greek, you have faith and faithfulness is the same word. And so it's you're living by the Messiah's faithfulness, his gift of righteousness, right? And of course, faith and faithfulness and then just and um just can be either just or righteous in the Hebrew and in the Greek, right? Um dekaios, right? That, I shouldn't be saying that because it's a sermon. But yeah, the Greek term can be just or righteous. And also the Hebrew term is just or righteous. So the righteousness, according to Habakkuk chapter 4, we're made righteous, we're made just by his, the Messiah's, faithfulness. And so we have that free gift of grace even here in the Old Testament passage from which Paul is quoting and of course, both in Romans 1, we have the idea that the gospel, of course, it's that central focus on Christ, as we saw at the beginning of the sermon um, in Romans 5, right? The idea that, therefore, right, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Um, who, he died for us even when we were in sin and unrighteous, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. And that's the central message of, of Romans. And then we have in Hebrews, Paul is using this term, these terms um, in Habakkuk. He's saying that 
Christ is the one we are waiting for. And it's very interesting that Hebrews chapter, or Habakkuk, um, excuse me, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3 has lots of connections with Daniel chapter 8. And of course, we know Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, right? And I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain sacred saint, which spake, how long shall be the vision, right? And so on. And then, of course, it said that unto 2,300 days, evenings and mornings, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Of course, that's verse 14. But in Daniel chapter 8, verse 17, <laughs> It says, right, the angel Gabriel was told to explain the vision of the 2300 days and so on to Daniel. And he says, understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. And um, Adventist scholars have recognized that you have the same, even in this one verse, you have like three of the same exact Hebrew terms that are used in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3, right? The vision, right? Um, Habakkuk 2 verse 3, right? Though the vision is yet for an appointed time, but though it tarry, wait for it, and so on, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. And here, of course, we have the vision is yet for a time, an appointed time, but it shall be at the time of the end, and so on. And so we have that connection, and early Adventists, though they were not much into the Hebrew text there, of course they used Strong's Concordance and other things, they saw the connection, and so you even have after, of course, Mil uh, William Miller originally said that Christ would come um, between March 1843 and March 1844, and that initial uh, disappointment in March 1844, you had people like Joshua V. Himes, they pointed to Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3, Right, saying that we should wait for the advent of the Messiah, for he would indeed come after the appointed time. And now, of course, he didn't come at that time, but we know that was only because he was entering into a different phase of his ministry into the most holy place uh, to begin that work of investigative judgment, right? Daniel 7 and other passages. But, even at our time, we know he is coming soon, and so we should be waiting for him, and that is very much a facet of righteousness by faith, right? We have the idea of theodicy, that, okay, we see in our modern world the corruption, the injustice, the wars, the rumors of wars, all of these things, but God's answer to us, as to Habakkuk, is, you, my son, my daughter, live by faith, by my faithfulness, right? That gift of faithfulness which I am giving to you. So we have theodicy, we have the coming of the Messiah. Hebrews 10, again, uh, 37 and 30, um, verse, verse, Hebrews 10, verses 37 and 38. Um, For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry, and the just shall live by faith. And so very beautiful things, and just to make sure to prove everything, of course, in Habakkuk itself, we have this theophany of God at the end of the book, in chapter 3, right? Verse 1, right? Verses 1 and 2, right? Oh, uh, verse 2, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid, right? And then verse 3, God came, right? Verse 4, his brightness was as the light, so you have this theophany, he sees God showing up. Um, of course, that's the whole idea of the Messiah's advent, Christ showing up the first time as that um, suffering servant who suffers for us and lives that righteous life so that we might receive his grace, the merits of his blood, right? And then the second time in glory to vindicate. And of course, due to what God's reply to Habakkuk we have in chapter 3 he says I will rejoice in the Lord of my salvation right in verse 17 we have this song of Habakkuk although the fig tree shall not blossom neither shall fruit be in the vines 
the labor of the olive shall fail and the field shall yield no meat the flock shall be cut off from the fold right so you have other pri privation here and there shall be no herd in the stalls yet i will rejoice in the lord i will joy in the god of my salvation the lord is my strength and he will make my feet like hind's feet and he will make me to walk upon mine high places and so on so we have a complete reversal in, in habakkuk chapter one we had habakkuk is frustrated he's complaining right and then of course god's answer the just shall live by faith, and it is our um, we our faith in God as well. But it's like it's there's a dual application here in, in um, as the between we have our faith in God and Christ's faithfulness to us, right? So that's it can be taken both ways. And in the New Testament, Paul even uses it both ways in the Book of Romans. He talks about our faith in Christ, but also ultimately Christ's faithfulness, right? Because we have in Romans chapter one we have the sin of the Gentile world. In Romans chapter 2, we have the sin of the Jewish world. In Romans 3, all are under sin, right? Romans 4, we have the faith of Abraham. He was justified by faith. And then in Romans 5, we have all, everyone, right, is justified. Um, we can have peace with God through faith and so on. His faithfulness. But of course, uh, Romans also talks about the obedience of faith, which is what we do. So it's a d um, dual meaning here. So that is... God's answer to Habakkuk, and it completely changes the outlook in, in Habakkuk in, in chapter 1. The outlook is utterly, it's dreary because of the situations in the world. But in, ch in chapter 3, he is full of hope and faith in God, right? Even if he's suffering privation. So for us at this time, even if we suffer the greatest par privation, the greatest hardship, we can we can rest assured that Christ's faithfulness will not leave us. And so we can have faith in his faithfulness. And this shouldn't be some kind of feeling of ecstasy. It should be a calm, abiding trust in Christ. And so I have the book Acts of the Apostles here by Ellen White. And one of my favorite quotes from this book of course we had the idea of God's holiness his righteousness is connected with the idea of his free gift of grace because God gives us in a sense his righteousness his holiness which we accept by faith but this holiness this grace is not rapture it's not ecstasy right it is not a um, this is page 51 the gift of the spirit is the chapter. It is not a conclusive evidence that a man is a Christian because he manifests spiritual ecstasy under extraordinary circumstances. Holiness is not rapture. It is an entire surrender of the will to God. It is living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is doing the will of our Heavenly Father. It is trusting God in trial, in darkness as well as in light. It is walking by faith and not by sight. It is relying on God with unquestioning confidence and resting in his love. And this is exactly the picture we see in Habakkuk, right? Because um, it says it is trusting God in trial, in darkness as well as in light. And of course, Habakkuk is about to face this Babylonian captivity. There's famine, right? There's um, the fruit of the ground is cut off. But even then, as we saw in Habakkuk chapter 3, he rejoices in the God of his salvation. He walks by faith and not by sight. This is is the true uh, justification by faith, right? It is an act of the will. We choose to have faith in God. It, we might not feel it, but we choose to do it. And so I pray that these thoughts here, which I have shared um, very briefly from God's word, will be a blessing to you. Um, to summarize again, we saw that, okay, um, People like Daniel Axtell, they might be willing to die for a good cause, for the cause of religious liberty, to lay down their life a thousand times. But God, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, so that we might have his, we might have his righteousness, his holiness imputed to us, right? And that we might become holy because of his free gift of grace, and that we can accept this even in times of privation. And when we are wrestling with theodicy questions, as Habakkuk was, of course, this grace is for 
all humanity, as Paul later brings out so well as he quotes Habakkuk. And of course, we are waiting on the coming of this, the Messiah, as Paul quotes in Hebrews chapter 10. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessing of your word and the blessing of your gift of righteousness by faith, of justification by faith. Be with us now and let these words sink in our hearts. Amen.